Quantum mechanics is a mathematical theory that will enable a physicist to observe and predict the processes at the atomic and subatomic level in matter. Schrodinger's wave equation is a core part of quantum mechanics and it's a complex differential equation the solution of which will enable a physicist to calculate the energy in a system. The hydrogen molecule which consists of two hydrogen atoms bonded together is the largest system for which a solution can be found for Schrodinger's equation. But the fact is every molecule has this wave function including the extremely complex aperiodic DNA molecule. Quantum mechanics tells us that an electron in an, in an atom has this wave function although we normally think of it as a particle and herein lies the essential weirdness of quantum mechanics. Every particle at the quantum level has this wave particle duality. If an observation is made this will collapse the wave function and the physicist will see a particle but if no observation is made it just continues on as a wave function. Schrodinger's equation is a mathematical theory but the fact is that everything that we see as around us in nature has this wave particle duality. Light and other radio waves are an electromagnetic field and they have wave particle duality. Electric current is quantized and this is very significant for biological systems because the living cell is a complex electrical circuit. Also there are many many processes in biology that involve ions and other minute particles passing through holes in membranes. If an observation is made this will collapse the wave function and a bio biologist will observe a particle pass through a hole. But if no observation is made then a multi-particle wave function passes through all the holes. Quantum mechanics has manifold applications in electronics because the nanotechnology places restrictions on the wave functions of particles, especially electrons in electric current. And herein lies the other major weirdness of quantum mechanics, quantum tunneling. In the macroscopic world, if an object cannot pass through a barrier, then the entire object bounces back, but not so in the quantum world. Even though there is a high probability that an electron will not pass through a barrier, there remains some probability that an electron, the electron will pass through the barrier and appear on the other side. With these general considerations about the application of quantum mechanics, it will be clear that should we find electron dense nanostructures in biological living systems, then we're clearly in the realm of quantum biology as should we find light and other radio waves playing a major part in biological processes. In fact, nanostructures are ubiquitous in biology and in the past decade or so there has been a whole new field of genetic research, optogenetics and radiogenetics, that's already yielded thousands of research papers detailing the effects on genetic processes of light and radio waves. Also, brain waves are extremely low frequency radio waves, so they come within the realm of quantum biology. Schrodinger noted the high degree of permanence in hereditary properties. For human beings and other animals, the phenotype, the visible and manifest nature of the individual, undergoes no significant changes for generations, for centuries, even millennia. For some species, the crocodile and the tortoise, for example, for millions of years. This high degree of permanence can only be explained on the basis that mutations are not frequent small random variations in the genetic material. 
Schrodinger then discusses the theory of Dutch biologist Hugo de Vries that in the offspring of even very pure bed stocks of barley there are a few individuals, two or three in tens of thousands, that exhibit small jump-like changes. Not that the changes are very significant, but they represent a discontinuity. There are no intermediate forms between the original and the new. De Vries called this phenomenon mutation. This notion of discontinuity in biological systems is very significant, as it is in quantum mechanics where there are no intermediate energies between neighboring energy levels. Figuratively, we are talking about a quantum theory of biology based on quantum jumps in the gene molecule. Schrodinger then notes that the DNA molecule is isomeric, which means of necessity that it will have a certain stability. The, config the configuration of the molecule will not change unless the energy difference necessary to push the molecule to a higher level comes from outside. These energy level differences are very precisely calculated and they definitively determine the stability of the molecule. Schrodinger then discusses the laws of thermodynamics and concludes that an isomeric change in the configuration of the DNA molecule caused by chance fluctuations in the vibrational energy would be seen as a sufficiently rare event as to be interpreted as a spontaneous mutation. At the time that Schrodinger was writing, this was the only thing that he could think of that would would provide a burst of energy sufficient to lift the electrons to a higher level and still remain part of the normal processes of the living cell in vivo. At the time, X-ray diffraction was well known and Schrodinger goes on to, dis to discuss X-ray induced mutations where there is a precise X-ray coefficient that indicates the percentage of the offspring that will be mutated when a unit dosage of X-ray is given to the parents. In other words, X-ray induced mutation is clearly not random, but nor are mutations induced by X-rays something that's going to occur in the, the living cell under normal conditions. It's been known since the 1970s that the DNA molecule absorbs and emits light. Biophotons are in the UV to low visible light range with wavelengths from 200 nanometers to 800 nanometers. Fritz Albert Popp, one of the pioneers of biophoton research, found that the DNA molecule absorbs UV light and then emits light at different frequencies. He thought that the light was being scrambled, but actually what is happening is the UV photons are pushing the electrons beyond the threshold for their energy level and making them jump to a higher level. When these electrons revert back to their base or a low, lower level, they emit light at very precise frequencies determined by the spectral lines in atoms developed in quantum mechanics. These spectral lines are in the UV to visible light range. The DNA molecule absorbs light, shows maximum absorption at 260 nanometers, and it will be noted that this is in the nanoscale range and it is also in the UV light range. In other words, this light is invisible. It's known that plants, specifically onion roots, communicate genetic processes amongst themselves using UV light. It's also well known that large doses of UV light will damage the DNA and cause mutations, but the fact is a single photon of UV light emitted from the DNA in one chromosome would be capable of initiating a genetic process in the DNA in another chromosome in the nucleus. These UV photons are invisible, so to all intents and purposes, 
the nucleus is in a dark state where nothing is happening. If communication in the nucleus of the cell is mediated by UV light, then the DNA is capable of initiating mutations in exactly the way envisaged by Schrodinger. We're talking here about a quantum theory of mutation of genetic material based on quantum jumps, where the mutation occurs by chance, but it is not random. According to probability theory in quantum mechanics, it's only the mutations with the highest probability that will actually occur. The, com the composition of the DNA molecule would suggest that it is a semiconductor. The core DNA base pairs are made up of carbon atoms interspersed with hydrogen, nitrogen and oxygen atoms. Carbon, like silicon, has four electrons in its valence shell and is a classical semiconductor. And the hydrogen and nitrogen atoms would act as doping agents. To dope a semiconductor makes it conduct electricity more readily. In fact, the doping of carbon nanotubes and other graphene composite structures with nitrogen is very common, and comparisons have already been made with the DNA. Hydrogen plays a very important part in the doping process because it readily lends its single electric electron to the nitrogen atom, so the DNA molecule contains nitrogen atoms that are slightly negatively charged and hydrogen atoms that are slightly positively charged. This means in turn that the DNA base pairs in the DNA double helix present as both a P and N semiconductor, where there are both electrons and holes available for conduction. The sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA double helix is negatively charged, so the DNA in vivo is normally, normally surrounded by positive counter-ions. The DNA is said to be ideal for electron transfer. The semiconducting properties of DNA also make it ideal for constructing nanoscale integrated circuits. The DNA molecule is just two nanometers in diameter and can be folded to any desired shape. The folded DNA is used as a scaffold to support nanoscale components such as electrically conducting carbon nanotubes. This process is known as DNA origami as it is reminiscent of the ancient Japanese art of paper folding. It's like the pegboard that people use in their garages to organize their tools, only in this case the pegboard self-assembles using DNA strands and the tools likewise find their own places upon it. However, isolated DNA does not conduct electricity very well. So the DNA is used as a scaffold and other materials are mounted on the DNA to make up the electronics. In fact, DNA does conduct electricity over long distances, but only if it's immersed in water or a phosphate buffer solution. This is its natural state in vivo, where the nitrogen elements are hydrophobic and the sugar phosphate backbone is hydrophilic. It's the hydrophobic nitrogen elements that actually cause the DNA to twist into its characteristic helical shape which keeps the water out of the middle of the molecule. And the sugar phosphate backbone is actually, actually hydrophilic. In fact, the DNA can only act as a conducting nanowire if it's in its helical shape. And the negatively charged sugar phosphate backbone creates an electron-rich liquid medium that is excellent for the conduction of electricity. This is why the DNA has been described as a metal for conducting electricity, as well as the fact that it is conducting an alternating current, AC. This is what you would expect if it's the water that's responsible for the conductivity. Water molecules are polar, and so the electrons can readily skip from one molecule to another to produce 
and alternating current, but they cannot readily travel from one molecule to another molecule to produce a direct current. A nanowire conducting an alternating current will transmit radio waves at the same frequency as the electric current. The DNA in vivo is a transmitter of radio waves and further a receiver or antenna receiving radio waves at whatever frequency whereupon an alternating current of the same frequency will be generated in the nanowire. Also, a semiconducting nanowire explains how the DNA can intermittently emit UV photons from the DNA in one chromosome in the nucleus to initiate genetic processes in the DNA in another chromosome in the nucleus. As there will be electrons in the conduction band falling back into their holes in the valence band, thus emitting UV and visible light. Thus we have a complete explanation as to how the DNA can initiate mutations in the nucleus of the cell as well as initiate normal genetic processes in the nucleus of the cell. An explanation that is far more reasonable than that offered by the neo-Darwinists that evolution has been caused by random chemical mutations. In any event, the laws of quantum dynamics determine the chemical reactions and not vice versa.